No one thought I was going to win. Even the top consultants thought I was going to lose because I had the Trumpers on my right and the Democrats on my left. They said, there's no way you can win if the people on the right are pulling votes from you and the Demo it's a Democratic district. Bill Stepien, who obviously ran Trump's campaign, worked for me for a while, was Christie's main advisor, told me, and I, I did hire him at some point, he said, build up your own brand. John Bramley, whatever. People want to know that you have your own brand, that you're not beholden to anybody. Best advice I ever got. Welcome to the Hero of the Hour podcast. Today, we're in for a treat. Joining us is a man of many talents, Senator John M. Bramnick. Representing the 21st Legislative District, John has not only made his mark in the political arena, having served as the Assembly Republican leader in the New Jersey General Assembly, but he's also a certified civil trial attorney. And if that wasn't enough, he's been recognized by New Jersey Super Lawyers Magazine as one of the state's top lawyers consistently since 2006. But wait, there's a twist. John is also known as the funniest lawyer in New Jersey. Quite the title, right? In our conversation, we'll delve into John's unique perspective on heroism, drawing inspiration from personal heroes like his father, who imparted invaluable wisdom throughout his life. We'll also journey into the lighter side of things, exploring how John earned his comedic title and his aspirations in the world of comedy, a Netflix special perhaps? Being in public office comes with its own set of challenges, and John emphasizes the importance of accessibility and respect. From charity auctions to comedy events, John's calendar is packed, but he remains committed to connecting with the people he serves. So gear up for a blend of inspiration, laughter, and insight as we dive into this engaging chat with Senator John M. Bramnick. Let the conversation begin. I am Mark B. Murphy, founder and CEO of Northeast Private Client Group, and I have my uh, third book coming out shortly called The Ultimate Investment, uh, which is owning a business and uh, the last great tax shelter. But I'm happy today to have not only somebody I admire, somebody who I think is a hero, but somebody I've known uh, for a long time, John Bramnick. I just want to read this and get this right, because I've got a guy that... Uh, not only is a hero to me, but somebody who's a hero to many other people in John Bramnick, somebody who's been a friend for a long, long, long time. But I just want to read this right because I want to get it right, John. You're a state senator. You were the leader in the assembly prior to joining the Senate. You're a certified civil trial attorney. You're a comedian. And uh, by the way, did I mention that... Uh, New Jersey Super Lawyers Magazine has you as one of the top lawyers in New Jersey since 2006, also titled The Funniest Lawyer in New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to the great John Bramnick. John, welcome. Thank you for thank you for coming. Best introduction I've ever had. 30 years. <laughs> I got to congratulate you. I don't know if it's 100 percent true, but, you know, in today's world, 99 percent is good. I uh all I want to tell you, you know, I, I, I have people on this podcast, we call it the Hero of the Hour podcast, John, because I have people here that are, people are heroes to me and, and people that are heroes to other folks like yourself. I just want to start by asking, when you use the word hero and you throw that word around, it gets thrown around a lot. What does a hero mean to you? Well, first, I don't look at myself as a hero, but I appreciate the nice compliment. The hero is when I get a call from someone who is either being bullied or abused or can't use the system. And as a senator, I can make a call and I can help that person. I had a situation where somebody wasn't getting heat or someone who couldn't get through to motor vehicles or someone who couldn't get a, a surgery done because uh, it was being blocked by an approval process. That to me, when you can help average people solve their problems and serious problems that's a hero well that then that certainly makes you a hero uh i i was gonna say you know we go back who are, who are some of your heroes if people were saying who, who do you say hey that's somebody that's made a difference to me well my dad i want to start with him he used to say if you look too closely at all your friends you won't have any friends <laughs> and he also 
you know, he was never said a bad word about anybody. And it was always like, try to understand the person as opposed to you being understood. And being nice to people and not expecting anything in return, uh, that was my role model. Uh, no question about it. And of course, my mom was a businesswoman, meaning that she went to college before women went to college, right? Yeah. She, uh, she, she, she was at NYU Business School and worked in my, with my dad in their business. So, you know, those are the heroes because, you know, they just, you know, just told me, uh, you know, respect people, work hard, treat people uh, like you'd want to be treated. You know, it's not that complicated, you know. Look, I'm not diving into a, a lake and saving anyone, though, I, you know, because I'm not a great swimmer and I failed to see the life saving, but I do it. Um, I mean, that's one type of hero. The other hero is just making everybody have a good day. And there was someone taught me this once, a fellow named John Rochford. He said, your job is to make somebody else have a good day. So those are my heroes. The people are not thinking about themselves and they're thinking about other people. Well, as I say, I, I think you serve four masters, at least, at least four. You're one of New Jersey's super lawyers. You're a leader in the in the state Senate. You're a husband and a great fa husband and father. And you're a professional comedian, one of the only lawyers I know that that gets paid to do comedy uh, or can, can get a paycheck to do that. So, uh, But I know, let's start with the first. I You opened your practice in, I think it was like 1984. You're going on just shy of 40 years as a lawyer. Why do you continue to focus on the practice of law and on personal injury cases? Tell me, tell us what your what your what your why there. All right. When I was a lawyer for the city of New York, I was making seventeen thousand five hundred, living a, living on like I go to a Chinese restaurant, have the chicken sub gum one time, and keep it for three nights. Right. I tried a case against a guy named Joe Iram. He hit me for six million dollars. I was making seventeen five. I said, "How much do you get?" He goes, I get one third, two million dollars. I go like this, got it. Okay, so I have my career path all set. 1984, I opened my own practice in New Jersey, did New York and New Jersey. I had a phone in the living room in my apartment in Plainfield. And what I did, I slowly, by respecting people and simply working seven days a week, now we got 55 people and 25 lawyers all from a phone in my living room in Plainfield. Not because I did anything special. I just, most important thing is you got to pick the right people to work with. You know, people are trustworthy, good people, you know, care about other people. And, you know, just work hard. And, you know, I don't think it's that complicated. It's been 39 years since she's opened the practice. How do you continue to navigate all the changes in the law, the legal challenges, uh, workers' compensation, criminal defense? I mean, criminal defense, you, you do an awful lot of stuff. How do you, how has that changed and how do you navigate it going forward? I rely on other people. In other <laughs> words, like I don't know much about workman's comp, but I got four lawyers and no workman's comp. I don't know anything about immigration. I got two great immigration lawyers, right? I got my son and another 15 personal injury lawyers. So basically, I ask questions. You know, I don't walk around like I have all the answers anymore. You know, maybe when I was alone, I had to come up with the answers. But now I can just walk down the hall and ask my son or somebody else who read the latest case on, you know, hey, what's going on with this? You know, when somebody is like disenfranchised or harmed or they've, you know, in any one of areas, they've, they've got a grievance. When they sit down with you, how do you kind of go about the process to make sure that they get sort of the best outcome? Well, I think first you have to think what a jury would do. You can't fall in love with your client. So you have to get a sense. What would six or in criminal cases, 12 people do? Normally, if you think about it, when you get six people in the room, you get six different opinions. So you have to say, okay, look at both sides of this equation is going to somebody who loves you and somebody who doesn't love you, right? Mm -hmm. So normally the outcome is going to be something in the middle. Now, if the client has expectations that are too high, I go, look, uh, I shouldn't be your lawyer. And if they come in with those high expectations that they think six people on a jury or 12 people are going to fall in love with them, I go like this, you probably should get another lawyer. I always like that. And they go, what are you talking about? Well, I don't think I'll meet your expectations. Those same people go, well, you don't know what my expectations are. 
and they argue with you. I go, ah, that doesn't work. So really, it's a question of figuring out where the trier of facts are going to be two or three years down the road. And if you have any common sense, which you know is really important, then you set the parameters and the expectations. And normally, it's somewhere in that middle range, the result. You know, it's funny. It reminds me, like when I, uh, I'd say I get to do it maybe eight, every eight to ten years, I get somebody who's just been a real jerk to me, or somebody that has out, you know, unrealistic expectations, or you know, they've jerked me around, or something like that. And you know, I think when you're that kind of person, you've jerked somebody around, or you have that experience. I think you know who you are. So my response, John, always to them is, I always say to them, you know what, John, I wish I had a hundred clients just like you. And they always get taken back because they'll go, you, you wish you had a hundred clients like me. I go, yes because I have a thousand like you right now. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I, you know, I think, it, I think part, you know, part of it is I, it, it's, it's amazing that I think that, you know, I've always used my humor as a defense mechanism and I think it served me very well. Um, you've taken that to a, an art form. You're the, uh, you're the Yoda or Svengali of, uh, of humor, which I know, it, it, that's just who you are. You're just a funny guy. You're a funny guy when you wake up in the morning. You're a funny guy in front of a jury. You're a funny guy on stage. H how did this? How did this all start? How did you? Uh, how did you? Know, I, I, I always start with everything. My question always is, how did you start? How did you get here? You know, how did you? Where, where'd you start? How did you get here? And where are you going right now? Well, years ago, I started to do auctions for charity. So whether it be the AIDS benefit. I did things for the World Trade Center uh, victims, and I would stand up and auction something off, but I would make it funny. I'd say something like, uh, here's a gift certificate uh, for uh, playing golf at Baltus Roll, and I'd go, yeah, you can play anytime in January or February. <laughs> so I, I started doing a lot of these auctions, 25 a year for charity. And then my wife entered me in the funniest lawyer in New York contest at Stand Up New York when I was 38. That's 30, 30 years ago. Okay. Came in second. Then the following year, I competed for the funniest lawyer in New Jersey, and I won. And I won every year for three years under the State Bar Association's auspices. And then they stopped the contest. Now, people say to me, well, why are you still the funniest lawyer in New Jersey? I said, two reasons. One, they haven't had the contest. <laughs> and two, I trademarked it. And I have. I trademarked the funniest lawyer in New Jersey. So I like this. Now, I consider myself the Muhammad Ali of funny <laughs> lawyer. So if you want to take me on, you got to come up through the ranks. Like Muhammad Ali doesn't fight some guy who hasn't had any fights. You're going to have to compete nationally or internationally. And then my agent will decide whether I will compete with you for my title. But right now, I've been holding that title for 30 years. I've got a big belt. I wear it around the house. Funniest lawyer in New Jersey. Crown. And um, now my wife doesn't think I'm that funny. I get off the stage. Occasionally, she'll go to the event. I go, how was that? She goes, you forgot to joke about Abby, our daughter. I go, how about, how was the rest of it? She goes, oh. oh. <laughs> I mean, Okay. It's uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think you'd be nearly as successful a lawyer as you are if you're not well written. Lawyers are lawyers at your level are well, are generally very well well written. Do you are you just a funny guy or do you write comedy? Do you kind of sit down and think about it like you think about a brief or something else like that? I mean, are you well, writing? Which, yeah. Well, see, that's why you're so successful because you know how to make ask good questions. Well, it's both. First, you have to have an innate ability to be funny. I mean, people aren't funny, you know, just they're not funny. They shouldn't try to be funny. Then I'll start to write. So the other day I wrote, I said, how am I going to do something on proving to people I'm a great trial lawyer on a comedy stage? I said, well, let's think about accidents in the past. And I go, hmm, you know, Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall. Right. I'm going, that's perfect. So I can act like I represented Humpty Dumpty. So then this goes on for hours and hours. I get two minutes and I come up with this thing. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Mrs. Dumpty gave me a call. I went out to the wall. There was no warning, no warning at all. You know, warnings are required by law. That's why Mr. Dumpty had this fall. So Mr. and Mrs. Dumpty are living a dream. You know why? Because they called John Bramlick and his personal injury team. So you might think that just came about. 
but I had to think about something that's funny in the past, something that everybody knows, because you, you have to say something that everybody's familiar with or you lose half your audience. Then you have to kind of work on it. And I think it turns out to be a poem, but it promotes the personal injury lawyer. So anyway, that's kind of it evolved, but it took me probably two weeks thinking about it to get that little poem. How about the fastest phone call in the West? That commercial was as as good a political ad as I've ever seen. I, and I know that had you, that had you all over it. I Meaning, I knew you wrote that. No consultant wrote that for you. You wrote that yourself. My theory is this: if you look like a politician and you sound like a politician, people won't like you. But there's one thing people like: constituent services. And you you know they'll say, uh, "What did John Brand McDo in the Senate?" And I don't know. He called me back. He called me back, you know, he helped my daughter. So I figured, how do I do something on a commercial that people will watch and also have some meaning? So I went to the Wild West City and I pulled my cell phone out in the middle of the street outside the saloon. And I had John Bramley, fastest return call in government and acted like it was a shootout at the Wild West. So in essence, no one's going to argue with you that that's not a good concept of returning someone's call. And no one can say, you know, if I go like this, the, the consultants always go, tell them you're going to lower taxes. I said, I'm not doing it. They go, why? I said, because nobody believes it. It's the number one issue. Yeah, I got that part there, genius. The problem is that when you say you're going to lower taxes, they're going to say, this guy's a liar. So yeah, so the consultants have it wrong many times. They, they poll the public and then want you to talk about the issue. That doesn't mean the public's going to believe you. Uh, by that, that's, that is that uh, is so brilliant. In fact, I'm going to have Brittany run this commercial. I'm going to run the commercial on this podcast in between our our our, uh, our conversation because I think it's such a fabulous, you know, it's not liberal or conservative. It's not Democrat. It's not Republican. It's not even for people who don't follow politics at all. Everybody, it's universal what you do. In fact, I, I think, I mean, I think there was a lot of people, you were in a tough race. I think there was a lot of people who didn't think you were going to win that race and you crushed it. It's got to be, that, that's got to be the secret to your success. No one thought I was going to win. Even the top consultants thought I was going to lose because I had the Trumpers on my right and the Democrats on my left. They said, there's no way you can win if the people on the right are pulling votes from you and the Demo it's a Democratic district. Bill Stepien, who obviously ran Trump's campaign, worked for me for a while, was Christie's main advisor, told me, and I, I did hire him at some point, he said, build up your own brand. John Bramley, whatever. People want to know that you have your own brand, that you're not beholden to anybody. Best advice I ever got. Well, you've, you've done it and done it in spades. Why, though, it's got to take a special person, meaning you've done... You led the you led the assembly for many many years. You're the leader of your party in the assembly. You've been successful as a lawyer. I know you're financially independent. I know you've done all the things that you need to do in your life. Thanks to you, I'm fine. Why, why take? Why take? Thank you. Why? Why? What, what drives you to keep? What drives you to keep doing this work? Which in which 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 some of it's got to be very thankless. You know, it's got to be. I mean, if no good deed goes unpunished. If that's the case, that's. That, that, that is part of the role of a state senator, at least. How, how what, what keeps driving you? you? You don't need it. Why do you do it? Well, let's start with the Senate position. Let me tell you, you try to help somebody who has a problem and you don't have that title senator, good luck. But I can pretty much get anyone in the state to return my call to help somebody. So that's enough to motivate me, just that. Uh, and as long as you're independent, at least you're not beholden anybody, you know, no power brokers telling me what to do. You know, it's a really good feeling where, you know, you can help people. And there's all kinds of issues. I mean, I put defibrillators in school. We saved a young girl's life. We're doing on grief education, a bill where, you know, there's no education and someone loses a family member what to do. So, uh, you know, that's really, it's, I love it. Uh, and as to the law, I have to tell you, the people who work with me, they're a family. Like, you know, I, I want to make sure all these people are successful. Uh, I almost had, I've only had one, you know, since 1984, I've only had one or two lawyers leave, one to be a priest, 
one and two one to be a judge and one or two left to say they wanted to do what I do, right? But everyone else has stayed because I, I'm trying to this it's a family to me. You know, many times, you know, I, I won't take any money out and I make sure everybody else makes more money. Uh, uh, that's a testament to who who you are, or one of one of many. I just think you have to respect people. You know, you got to treat people well, and and it works. When you treat people well, success is easy, easy. Can you know one of the things that is a pet peeve of mine? I moved out to New Jersey from New York. I still, you know, still got you know, still in New York, still in Florida a little bit, but New Jersey's my residence. That's where I I reside in Short Hills. And one of the things that bothers me so much is that as my kids have gotten older and you go to, they put the graduation sign on the front lawn and right next to us, the for sale sign. And the idea is, which, which bothers me that this is not a destination place or a place to retire. It bothers me that Rutgers university is as fine a university as any in the country as a state school and kids from, uh, you know, from New Jersey dream about going to Michigan or USC or Texas or any of these places, but kids in California, Texas, and Michigan don't dream about coming to Rutgers. And so one of the dreams that I have would be to make New Jersey a cradle to grave state, a destination state where, where, where this is not only a great place to raise a family, a great place to start a business in and a great place to retire. What do you think? Well, if you open a business across the street and the prices are 20% lower, you're going out of business. So now, you know, it's pretty much easy to work from different locations remotely. So take Florida has no state income tax. So somebody with your kind of wealth, right? Uh, and you save 10% because New Jersey is going to be a 10% is a 10% income. 10, uh, seven, 10, seven, five. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's assume, you know, you're making a lot of money. That That's another mortgage. You could buy another home. So, the problem is, and look, now I'm going to get partisan for a minute. The Democrats have controlled the legislature for 20 years. We've had, you know, for a short period of time, uh, for two terms, we had Governor Christie. But, excuse me, but the bottom line is, you know, you need, need to do structural changes on how we spend money in this state. That's one of the reasons, as a Republican, I've tried to fight, you know, the Democrats on the issue of, you know, fiscal integrity, being fiscally conservative. And that hasn't worked because they're not afraid of the Republicans winning. You know, my district is a mixed district, but bottom line is that most of the districts are Democratic. And, and that's why, you know, they spend more money than the Republicans. They just do. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, Governor Christie. Uh, I was, I was uh, surfing the web on a on a site, and they were talking about who would be a great governor. And uh, the name that I, I saw three names come up a lot. I saw Elon Musk, I saw Gandhi, and I saw John Bramnick. So uh, we're on this website. So I, uh, you're in pretty good company with Elon Musk and Gandhi. Uh, you know, what kind of governor would Governor Bramnick be? Uh, it would be all about average people. It would be, and it would also be this it would be treating people with respect. All due respect to Mr. Donald Trump, but you know you can't be calling people names. And the Republican Party needs to look like they're a reasonable alternative to the Democrats. Mostly, uh, I would show respect for everyone else, and I would work across the aisle because you know when you're Republican, you're running for governor, and all you're talking about is how you hate Phil Murphy. And I like Phil Murphy as a person a lot. We're friends, right? that doesn't instill confidence in the public. So they got to think that John Bramnick is a reasonable alternative to the Democrats and not some lunatic. And some of the people in our party act like lunatics and give us a bad name. So, you know, if you're calling people names and, you, and you're acting like a nut, you know, no one wants to vote for Republicans. So I'm going to be, I call it old school Republican, like George Bush Sr. Show respect civility, you know, try to manage people's money and not be a nut. You know, there's a, you know, I, obviously uh, you, I, you have a great deal of humility. A lot of, con I would say, I say what I love, uh, one of the things I love about you is incredibly confident, but also humble at the same time. I, I think you always remember where you came from, but 
One of the things I think I, I read a lot and think a lot about a lot is leadership. So you've been a leader no matter where you've gone. How, how does, with a group as diverse as, say, an assembly which has 80 members, how do you, how, how do, why are you the guy as opposed to the other 79 guys or the other guys in your caucus? I, I, I said as 10 years as a Republican leader in the assembly as a moderate Republican, right? You ba basically you develop personal relationships and you show them respect and you do what you say you're going to do. And you being as successful would understand that. Somebody told me that if you graduated from college and all you did was do what you say you're going to do, you'd be successful. You'd never believe it. So if I say to another member, uh, could be a right wing member or somebody more moderate than me, hey, I'm going to call you back tomorrow, 10 o'clock call you back tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Make sure, how can I help you? Uh, I see something. How can I come in your district and help you? And sometimes you have business relationships because we're part-time legislators. You have to have a multi-faceted relationship with people. So they think you're honest. They think you work hard. And they'll overlook the fact they disagree with you on some issues because it's more about personal relationships. So you build personal relationships. I used to take the caucus away. You know, some years we went down towards Atlantic City. Sometimes we went up to Sussex County and we spend a couple of days together. And that's the other thing. We not spend any time together. And we spend time with the families together too. Now it's hard for them to hate you close up. You know, my 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 uh my first uh I've got my first two experience have been in politics, and obviously I love I love to, you know, I, I think, I think uh, I always say, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. And I think it's, it's everybody, it's everybody's right to, to, to participate. But I remember as a kid, this was in, is, was in high school. My first, my first two experience with col in, in uh, politics were there was a congressman. We, we grew up in Suffern, New York, just over the border of New Jersey, you know, well, literally a nine iron from New Jersey, just to, in Rockland County, New York. And when the Tappan Zee Bridge opened, everybody, all the people from the city moved to Rockland County. So it went from a farming Republican town to five Democrats for every Republican. And there was a guy in there, our congressman was Ben Gilman, who I got to know when I was in high school. And he was out, it was literally a five to one, five Democrats registered for every Republican. He kept winning and it would drive the Democrats flipping crazy. And the reason they had had it is why I think you're the Ben Gilman of New Jersey, or he's the, he's the John Bramnick of New York. Or God rest his soul, was because everybody said, "Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm a Democrat. I don't like Republicans." But everybody had a Ben Gilman story about Ben Gilman helped my mother. Ben Gilman called me back. Ben. So when you say that, it drove it drove those Democrats party because they were literally a five to one. This guy shouldn't even been on the ballot, and he would win and win hands down. And that's what you've done so successfully. Well, uh, Twenty years. So I'm bumping to people all the time. I met two people today, and they said, "Oh, you know, well, thanks so much. I remember seven years ago I called you about this." And you know what happens when you do it for that long, you just can't. And also the busier you are, the less you can remember everything you've done because you're going from event to event to event. You're not really thinking about what happened yesterday. And that's what improves memory to some degree. So I, I, I can't remember it, but very rarely do I show up somewhere and someone does say, oh yeah, I, you did the auction for the Boy Scouts or you did the auction or I saw you at the comedy thing or you called my grandmother. And look, it's all about the fact that when someone calls you, you make sure you return that call and you treat people with respect. It ain't that complicated. Well, every time I call you, you know, there are people who don't, but you always say, I'll call you in a few minutes, I'll call you in eight minutes, I'll call you tomorrow. That's all you got to do. People understand you're busy, Mr. Mark Murphy. They know you're busy, but the fact that you can respond is a really big deal. That's all people want. They want to make sure that you're accessible. Why do you think people um, don't get that? I mean, Woody Allen said 90% of life is showing up. Why do, you, why do you think that that is like such a revelation to most people? Well, first, you know, you have a lot of endorphins. So you thrive on the action, right? I thrive on the action. Uh, to me, a vacation is not sitting on the beach, right? That's not a vacation. A vacation may be doing like six nights in a way in uh, row in comedy. <laughs> so first you have to judge if you're one of these people who can't take the pressure and the tension and the constant calls, 
Yeah, you're not going to do very well. We love that stuff, you and I. We love, oh, yeah, if, if I get five calls in a row, you know, you know, if nothing's happened, I'll fall asleep at my desk. Yeah, now it's, you know, it's it's funny. I think you get to a point where you don't work. You, you don't work, certainly not work. You are not working for the money. Uh, it's, I think it's more that like when I started my firm 37 years ago, I, I, I'd hope we were going to be successful. I thought we'd be successful, but, um, this was my vehicle to make other people's lives better. And so the idea to me is that is like, what are you going to retire? Retire to what? Uh, I, I want to, you know, it's, it, you know, it has nothing to do with money. I think people say, you know, when are you going to, people start asking you, when do you think you'll retire? What are you going to, and I go, what do you retire to what? What are we going to do? You're going to play golf all day. You're going to make restaurant reservations. You're going to not, you, you spent your entire life trying to, trying to elevate others and make a difference. And now all of a sudden you're just going to go, Oh, I'm going to you know go to the dry cleaner every day and drop off. The, I mean, what? But also the other thing, you know, you will do is, and I say this over, you keep your word. So if I call Mark Murphy, not only will he help you, but he'll get it done, right? How many people you call actually get it done? And they'll say, blah, 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 they can't do it. So, you know, I guess I feel guilty if I don't do it. I don't get it done, right? And you, you know, you're the master of that, getting stuff done. Well, I learned from the best, but I, I would say that, uh, what is that famous Yoda line from Star Wars? Do or no, or don't do, there is no try, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you try, I, I, that's not my vocabulary. It's a, it's do, you know, or like when I say to one of the young guys who works for me, I'd say, please give, please, please, please call John Bramnick and ask him X, Y, and Z. And I'll say to him, did you get a hold of John Bramnick? I go, oh, I left him a voicemail. I go, I didn't ask you to leave a voicemail. I told you to call him and get, <laughs> that wasn't the task. The task wasn't to leave him a voicemail. The task was to accomplish the task, get it done. Come back to the person with more than they beat their expectations. That's that's incredible. And, you know, I have a couple of investigators in my personal injury firm. I call them up. I say, I need you to go out and do this. One second, they say, got it. They go out and do it. Next day, it's on my desk. You know, I, I, look, as I said, I, I can, here's my, my, I had a secretary in New York who used to say, I can do bad by myself. <laughs> that's a, that is a, that is it. That I'm is putting it. that in my next book, actually. I'm going to have all these different expressions and concepts that people have talked about. I forgot I got to add that when I get off this uh, Zoom. I, I got, I've got, I've my third book coming out. You've written a couple of books. In fact, Lisa, my wife thinks the book, the comedy book you wrote was hysterical. She said she had this guy's hysterical. She wants to see you in concert. But uh, you've written, a, you've written also a legal book. T tell me about your work as an author. Well, the, th that was a, a legal thing for ICO years ago on on automobile accidents. That's got to be almost 25 years ago. The most recent book is Why People Don't Like You. Uh, you don't have to read the book, Mark. I read Mark. it. It's, it's great. John, it is, you can't put it down. It's hysterical. It is, it's, a, it's really a book for a coffee table or a bathroom. I never think. I always laughed and Chris Christie said, because my wife did all the drawings, and all I have is like two lines, you know, whatever it might be. And he go, so wife did all the work. What did you do? Because <laughs> the drawings are harder than the little five words underneath the drawing. It's like a cartoon just book. Just give everybody who's watching this podcast, get, just give them the name of the book and where can they find the book? Yeah, sure. You can go on Amazon and it's called Funny. Oh, funny I'm sorry. It's called Why People Don't Like You. And all you have to put in is Why People Don't Like You on Amazon. and um, they'll sell you a book it's a, no i i'm telling you it's uh you know uh you know, she, I, i'm just telling you the book is the book is amazing it is so so damn funny uh in fact uh i hope you have a follow-up to that it's uh yeah i think my next book i'm working on is it's gonna be maybe you're the problem <laughs> it it's uh, you need a title hard. that people will pick up. So you know, maybe you're the problem, and every and everyone's looking. I go like this, yeah. You know, that person is the problem. Kind of thing. I think it's true. It's uh, now that is that, no. I think it's. I think that. I think that's that's uh. Th so do people? Uh, but it's interesting. That's uh. Do you think people who know you, they know you from every like people? Do do you think there's some people that don't know you're a state senator or don't know or know you know he's a state senator and don't know you're a lawyer? Or don't know, or do you think people people are smart enough to to get it all? 
Oh, no, no. People, first of all, they have no idea when you're a politician what you do, right? Unless you're the mayor of the town, they'll go, uh, I'll be down in Florida, go, oh, this is the congressman, right? Or this is the councilman. And assembly is the worst, right? I was stopped at a rest stop on the turnpike. And these two people came up, saw my plate, and it said assemblyman, right? And it had that number one on it and the seal. He goes at this, which assembly of God are you with? So, you know, the, the politics, they don't know. They, they do know the, see, they don't know that. The lawyer thing, they're not that interested in, because, I mean, they lawyer, I don't want to talk to you. But the comp, if you mention three things, you know, I'm a state senator, what do you do? You know, you meet some people. Yeah, and the state sign, great. They don't know what that is. A uh, lawyer, I go, I'm a comedian. Oh, you do comedy. So it's interesting. That's much more interesting to people than the other two, hands down. They want to know, oh, comedy, can I see? You know, people want to laugh. They don't want, they want to hear about politics, and they don't want to hear about your law practice. Well, I think um, people do, do laugh at politicians, but uh, most of the time, uh, with you, it's intentionally. It's not uh, unintentional. That's, uh, that's, uh, but but it, hey, by the way, one of the things there is, I was taking a look at the website, and I know you mentioned your know, personal injury, and you mentioned immigration. You do a, you all you have a pretty big broad practice, but the thing that's interesting is you also have some practice areas that very few, if any, firms or certainly reputable firms of of your type do that kind of work in the state. Just tell people what, what kind of law do you do because you do you do some you do some unique stuff. Obviously, we do accident case and we do work related accident and immigration. But what is interesting is we bring what they call first party claims against insurance companies when they deny coverage. Insurance companies are really good at saying, oh, you know, that's not in the policy or you didn't call us fast enough or, you know, we're not going to pay for that kind of coverage. We have a fellow named Carl Salisbury who pretty much wrote the book on, we'll call them first party claims. That means when your company, doesn't deliver for you that that's a limited area of practice there's only a not a lot of lawyers in the state of new jersey who concentrate on first party insurance and some of it is business like if a business doesn't get coverage for an environmental claim or some a malpractice claim that's when carl comes in and and brings a claim the immigration stuff's interesting because there's a lot of people who want to come to the country or have a or going to be extradited from the country it's not extradited what's the word uh sorry about that i don't do immigration law but th that is an interesting deported, right deported yeah deported and you know they're they're, they're being arrested whatever so uh, we have a pretty interesting group there and i like that practice because i like helping people who are here and hard working people uh what else of interest um no, I, I would think the first party claim is the most is probably the most unique part of the practice. Even even things like DWI and DUI oh, yeah. and that kind of stuff, or uh, you know, yeah. you know, animal bites. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's like you know, there's almost there's almost nobody's family. You know that that you know, not everybody is going to you know, you may you may get your your will and estate plan done every every five or ten years. You may. But it seems like everybody in the family, there's almost something in one of your expertise that some family gets affected by almost every year and, and you can help them with. Yeah, I mean, when a child gets in trouble because, uh, you know, he was out in underage drinking or, you know, back then when marijuana was illegal or they get jammed up, uh, you know, in some sort of accident or DWI or they're arrested, you know, even kids, they make mistakes, shoplifting, et cetera. So, I consider us street lawyers. We represent. We don't really represent companies. We represent individuals. That one exception is an insurance, you know, an insurance coverage claim. But uh, most of the time, it involves individuals who did something stupid, or either they did something stupid, or somebody did something stupid to them, like they ran them over, right? Or the kid, you know, got caught shoplifting. So that's why I haven't had a slow year in forty years. Because everybody's doing something stupid. Yeah. The, the other thing I we're, also find is king is stupid. I also find with that is that um, there's an awful lot of what I'll call like the the big high the white the, you know those those firms that represent the big insurance companies take the money from the insurance companies or the deep pocketed folks, and so you'll find you're finding that I think the average guy 
has a hard time finding a great lawyer and having so, certainly somebody of your caliber. I think it's 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 hard to find. So I think I think it, you know in many ways, as much as the comedy everybody may not know, I think it's I think it's a it's a it's a it's a well kept secret that I think the average person who doesn't have the resources that some of the rich and powerful have that to be able to know that they have a guy and a firm like yours to represent them, I think. I think that I think when that word gets out, I, I don't think you'll I don't think you'll be able to uh, you'll have to, you know, 10 X the size of your practice. And it's pretty damn big to start with. Well, the other thing we do is we invest in the cases. You know, when we bring a claim, we fund that claim and we we fund hundreds of thousands of dollars a month against the big guys. Right. And that's the thing you have to be careful when you're hiring a lawyer to represent you, let's say, in a personal injury claim. You want to make sure that they're not afraid to spend money because you got to spend a lot of money to bring these claims. You got to get the right experts. We have uh, serious death cases. Uh, we have a case where someone fell off a cell tower. You know, you need top experts in the country to actually testify in those cases, and they're very expensive. So you need the resources, and they can't be afraid to take on big insurance companies who are going to take years to pay. I don't care. I'm happy to lose my money, but I'm not taking peanuts from insurance companies. Just not doing. It. John, we gave the we gave the name of the book, and we can get it on Amazon. G give us, give everybody here a couple other. Give them uh, if they if they need to contact and get a great street personal injury. Just give us, give me, the, give me the address, the phone number there, or whatever you'd like to give. Sure, you can contact me at John Bramnick at johnbramnick.com, John Bramnick at bramnicklaw.com. You can call us at. 908-322-7000. You can call us at 1-877-I-BE-HURT. That's the one I use on my comedy uh, stage. One eight Now 1-800-I-BE-HURT. 1-877-I-BE-HURT. Let's see. You can use my cell phone. 908-591-9245. That's 908-591-9245. You can call me anytime. People say, how do you give your cell phone away? I said, listen, go out for dinner with my wife. She takes my cell phone away. She goes, you're going to answer that? But then I have a backup on my ankle. I'm like <laughs> Clint Eastwood, you know. I always carry a backup cell phone on my ankle just in case my wife takes my phone away. Then I go in the bathroom and I return your call. How about, and the last thing, I think people want to laugh, John, is is so I, I know, you know, depending on when they watch this podcast, it could be, could be whenever. Uh, they, they, they might watch it. If they want to say, I'd like to, I'd like to go see this guy do stand up. How do they go find out where you're performing? Sure, uh, Google "funniest lawyer in New Jersey" and my website will come up, which is funniestlawyerinnewjersey.com. And not only can you see some videos, but the calendar of my comedy uh, is on there. For example, I'm going to be at Catch a Rising Star February 10th. I'm going to be at on February 22nd. I'll be in Naples, Florida, at Off the Hook Comedy Club. Actually, next week, I'm going to be, this one, I don't think you can go to, like Cinnamon Cove, which is like a senior citizen place in Fort Myers or Mike Marino. March 8th, we're going to do an event at, at uh, Stress Factory with Vinnie Brand. It's going to be New Jersey comedians. We're going to raise money for a charity. We haven't decided which one yet. And uh, that's it. But you can watch it right online at Funniest Lawyer in New Jersey. Competition is pretty light, though. Just so you, know. so if you think it's funny, just remember. And I always start off by saying this to the audience. I got some bad news for you, and I got some good news. The bad news is you paid money to see a lawyer tell jokes. I said, the good news is I'm not getting paid either. So none of your money is coming to me. You know, that you know, maybe maybe the dream, I don't know your dream or not, we, you know, you haven't articulated it directly, but you know maybe the dream of being a, a public servant is to wind up being governor or or beyond. As a comedian, you you want to dream to be on the Tonight Show. What what would be the dream of a of a of a comedian? Uh, I think a Netflix special. You know, forty five minutes an hour on stage. I have about forty five minutes of material. Uh, I think that now is the new wave. Uh, you can probably go because people aren't watching as much TV. We were growing up. You're on Johnny Carson. That was a big deal. You're on Jay Leno. It was a big deal. But when you speak to the young people today, they don't watch that much TV. So I think that Netflix special and 
you know, we'll do the, we'll get Mark Murphy to be the MC, go like this. Hello, I'm Mark Murphy. I made hundreds of millions of dollars and I am really good at what I do, but I'm not funny. So I'm going to turn this <laughs> over to John Bramlick, but thanks for watching the Netflix special. But just remember, what's it, Northeast Private, what's the client name? Group. Of Northeast Private Client Group. Northeast Private Client Group. Now, they ain't funny, but they're funny. Oh, my video. See, something happened there. There. That was weird. I was, uh, well, I, I got to tell you, John, first of all, thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are. I also know, uh, you know, that I, I know an awful lot of politicians, but, uh, you know, the highest compliment I can give you is uh, I don't know too many public servants. I know a couple and uh, you're clearly one of those. And I, I just I just wish uh, more people would enter every one of your fields like you. And just thanks for being my friend. Thanks for the service you give to the state and this country and to all those people and all of what I'll call the average people that you're giving them a chance to to to, to stick up for them in every aspect of your life. So, so that's why you're a hero to me because you stick up for the, for the, for, you stick up for the regular man, for the average man. And, and uh, there aren't too many around and, and, and thank you for that. And thank you for your service. That's very kind. I appreciate being on this zoom, being on your podcast. And I got to thank you for everything you've done for my law office and the friends I've recommended to your office. I really appreciate that because they call me and they thank me. Well, thank you. You're the, you're the best. I will talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.